This is the first of several video lectures on Chapter 11, Linear Feedback Systems. In this video, we'll learn how to find the transfer function of six very different types of physical systems. Let's start with a quick review of the importance of the transfer function, which we learned about in Chapter 9. H of S, or the transfer function, allows us to model a system mathematically using a block diagram. So in our typical notation, we have the input coming in from the left, going into a system, and the system is represented by the transfer function, H of S, and then the output of the system comes out over here. So H of S allows us to, to determine the system's output, Y of S, for any input, X of S, using simple algebra instead of complicated differential equations. So we'll be working in the Laplace transform frequency domain. In this case, the input signal, instead of x of t, we'll think of it as x of s, which is the Laplace transform of the input. The system, again, is represented by the transfer function h of s. And then the output, y of s, in the Laplace transform domain is equal to the transfer function h of s multiplied by the input x of s. So again, here, this is just simple algebra. Uh, we don't have to do any convolutions here. The transfer function H of S also allows us analysis of the system stability. We'll see how to do that in later videos in this chapter. H of S provides a direct pathway to the frequency response. So basically all we have to do to get the frequency response H of J omega, we just start with the transfer function H of S and we let S be the special case where S is just equal to J omega, and that gives us the frequency response. H of S is used to design and analyze control, control systems using feedback and controllers, along with many other applications of linear feedback theory, which we will explore in other videos in this chapter. Uh, finally, the transfer function, H of S, allows us to find the impulse response, H of T, and the step response, S of T, via Laplace transforms. So, little h of t is just uh, the time domain version of uppercase h of s. So we have, this is the impulse response h of t. If we take the Laplace transform, we get the transfer function h of s. And we will not be working with step functions in this chapter or course, but um, it's a simple uh, way to get from uh, s of t is the step response with system, which in Laplace transform domain is uppercase s of s. And that's just equal to the transfer function, h of s divided by s. So again, here we see the transfer function allowing us to quickly determine the step response of a system. So this is a, a more formal definition of a system's transfer function, h of s. Uh, mathematically, a system's transfer function, h of s, is defined as the Laplace transform of the system's impulse response, h of t. So we saw this in uh, chapter nine, where h of s is given, this is just the Laplace transform integral, um, and inside the integrand here, we see h of t, the impulse response. h of s is also defined as the ratio of system output, y of s, to the system input, x of s, in the Laplace transform domain. So again, we see this um, simple uh, diagram here where we have x of s going into our system. The system has a transfer function, h of s, and it spits out the output y of s, which is just equal to h of s times x of s. Thus, we can see from this relationship here at the output, if we solve for the transfer function h of s, it's just the ratio of the output over the input. So in this uh, video, we're gonna look at six different examples of finding the transfer function. And in all these cases, um, the method that we will follow to find a system's transfer function is first of all, to identify the input and output variables for the system. So the input, um, we conventionally call that X, and the output Y. Another way to think of this is in terms of cause and effect um, for a physical system, um, the input is the cause and the output is the effect of that cause. Um, so once we have that, then we're gonna determine the differential equation that relates the output to the input. Once we have the differential equation, we can take the Laplace transform of this differential equation. We'll set any initial conditions to zero. And finally, we can solve for h of s, our transfer function, which is again, the output 
over the input or y of s over x of s. So let's start with a simple example. Let's find the transfer function for an accelerating car with no friction or air resistance. So we've got a car that's initially at rest at position zero, and we'll, uh, let's let the car's engine be providing a constant thrust of T uh, pushing forward here, as seen in this diagram, and we'll start that at T equals zero. We're gonna find the transfer function for the car's velocity with respect to the thrust. So um, one thing we can see here is we have to identify what is our input and what is our output. So the input here is the thrust of the car's engine pushing the car forward. And that, you know, in other words, that is the um, cause. And then what is the effect or the output? In this case, um, we're going to choose the car's velocity or V of T as the output of this system here. So, um, you know, this is basically physics 101 here. We can use Newton's second law and write that the net force is equal to the mass times acceleration of the car. Um, if we look at our diagram here, we're dealing with forces in the horizontal direction. Since we're ignoring friction and air resistance in this simple example, the only force on the car is the thrust from the engine. So the net force on the left is just T for thrust. And on the right side, what we have to do here is rewrite this in terms of the car's velocity. Well, we know that acceleration is the derivative of velocity, dv dt. So our equation, uh, Newton's second law, becomes thrust is equal to mass times dv dt. Once we're here, we can just take the Laplace transform of our differential equation. So thrust becomes t of s. Uh, dv dt, we're going to use the differentiation property. Remember that when we take a derivative, we pick up a factor of s. So on the right side, I have the mass times s times v of s, which is Laplace transform of the velocity. Finally, we can write the transfer function as the output velocity divided by the input thrust. So just solving this equation here for v over t, we end up with 1 over m, which is the mass, times s, um, and that's probably enough, or we can rewrite this if we want to put all the constants on top. We just have the uh, one over the mass on top divided by an S. So this is a one over S type transfer function. All right, let's do one that's um, a little more difficult um, and also a very different type of system. So here we're going to um, find the transfer function for a damped harmonic oscillator. So we've got a mass on a spring here. Um, it's initially at rest um, at position A, okay? So notice it's not um, at its equilibrium position here, zero. And then at T equals zero, um, we're going to apply an external force F of T, all right? And you know we don't know the exact form of this force, but uh, we're just gonna leave it as F of T. Uh, we'll model the spring force uh, using Hooke's law as usual, so that's F is equal to minus KX, where K is the spring constant. And we'll also model drag or wind resistance using Stokes formula, where the drag force is equal to minus B, which is just a constant or a coefficient, times the velocity V. Um, what we're gonna do here in this problem is we're going to take our input um, or you know our cause as the uh, applied force F of T, and we'll take our output or our effect as the uh, position of the mass here, which is x of t. So again, we're going to start with Newton's second law, net force equals ma. And for the net force, you know, we can see from our uh, diagram up here, we have f of t pointing to the right, so that's positive. Um, the Hooke's, Hooke's law uh, spring force is going to be minus kx because it's gonna be pulling uh, back in the opposite direction of the displacement, x. And then we have the drag force minus b v. And that's all equal to the mass times acceleration. Now, since we're, we wanna write this in terms of the position of the mass, we want everything in terms of x. So um, notice here, we've got x here, that's good. We have to convert this v, which is velocity, into position. So uh, velocity is dx dt. And then as we did in the last example, acceleration um, is actually the second derivative of the position. So acceleration is d squared x over dt squared.
All right, so we can rewrite all this um, and we have our differential equation. So I'm going to put my highest uh, derivative over here on the left, um, which is sort of a standard uh, notation. So I have m times second derivative of x plus b times dx dt plus kx equals our driving force f of t. At this point, we're going to take the Laplace transform and we're going to ignore initial conditions. So um, the first term here, we're going to use the differentiation property. So we have a second derivative that gives us a factor of s squared. So we have m s squared times the transform of x. That's the uppercase x there. The second term, we have a first derivative of x. So that gives us um, a factor of s in front of the x. This is again using the differentiation property of the Laplace transform. Um, kx here just becomes k times uppercase x. And then on the right side, our force uh, function in terms of time is going to be transformed into the force function in, in terms of s. So this is the Laplace transform of uh, the force function. Um, notice on the left side, we have a common factor of x in all three terms. So we can factor out that x, and in brackets, we have ms squared plus bs plus k. Um, finally, we can write our transfer function. h of s is the output, which in this case is the position of the mass, right? That's x, divided by the input, which is our applied force, f of s. So just uh, doing a little algebra here, um, taking x over here, and we have to just divide by everything inside the parentheses here, or the brackets, and so we get our transfer function is 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k, um, and that could be factored um, if we want to. Uh, we could use the quadratic equation, which I show down here, uh, just to factor this, and this gives us then s1 and s2, which are given by this expression here, uh, quadratic equation. Those are the poles for this transfer function. Okay, let's look at another example here. Um, this one's a little bit different. Uh, we're going to look at um, uh, a rocket taking off from the launch pad, and we're going to find the transfer function for this rocket during liftoff. So the output um, of our system here is going to be the rocket's vertical position y, in other words, how how high it gets in altitude, and the input uh, function is going to be the rocket engine thrust. So here's a, a free body diagram for our rocket. We have thrust uh, pointing up, and we have the rocket's weight pointing down. Uh, we're going to ignore uh, drag or wind resistance in this problem just to make it a little bit easier. So let's start by writing Newton's second law again. Net force is equal to ma. And from the free body diagram, we see that our net force is thrust up minus weight down. And um, since we're using um, y as our output variable, we need to rewrite the acceleration in terms of the second derivative of y. So I'm using the dot notation here. So this is y double dot. Um, from here, we can take the Laplace transform of this differential equation. So I have t of s, the Laplace transform of the thrust, minus the weight. Now the weight is constant, so that's still just going to be mg or the weight. And over here on the left, I'm um, sorry, the right side, we have the mass times the second derivative of y. So again, by using uh, the differentiation property, we pick up a factor of s squared in front of our Laplace transform y of s. Finally, uh, here we can solve for y of s. Um, and let's see, so we've got, we're going to divide everything by ms squared. So we have y of s is equal to t of s minus w over ms squared. The transfer function, h of s, is the output over the input. So the output, again, is the y position and the input is the thrust of the rocket. So if we take y up here and divide everything by t, the thrust, that should give us our transfer function. So look what happens when we do this. T of s divided by T of s is of course just one, but this term here, minus w, well, we have minus w over T of s, and then the denominator is still the same. But this is a problem because our transfer function, h of s, is dependent on the thrust of the rocket. And we want to get a transfer function that is independent of the input to this system. So there's a little trick we can do here. 
Um, and this shows up in some problems like this um, when there are uh, constant forces um, in the problem. We're going to redefi uh, redefine a so-called effective thrust. The T effective is defined as the rocket's thrust minus the force of gravity or minus the weight of the rocket. So in effect, this is uh, like the net force on the rocket. So in this case, um, Y of S, if we look at this uh, up here in step four, um, the transform from Y is T minus W. Well, T minus W is just our effective thrust. So Y is equal to T effective, that's the Laplace transform of that, divided by MS squared. And now we can write our transfer function H of S in terms of T effective as the output Y over the input T effective. And our transfer function is then one over MS squared. And you know, notice here, the transfer function is independent of the input thrust of the rocket when we're dealing with this effective thrust. Our next example is satellite attitude control transfer function. So attitude control is controlling the orientation of an object with respect to an inertial or non-rotating frame of reference. For example, a satellite must maintain its orientation such that its solar panels face the sun and its antenna faces the earth. So what we're gonna do here is consider a simple single axis attitude control system due to a thruster, which creates a thrust force T that rotates the satellite about its CG or center of gravity as shown. So here's our diagram of our satellite. Um, here's the thruster. You can think of this as a, a tiny little rocket engine here. And when the thruster ignites, it shoots out gases, and this pushes uh, with a thrust force by Newton's third law in the opposite direction. So this pushes the satellite in the direction shown here by the arrow. Now what's gonna happen since this satellite is floating um, in space is that this thrust here is going to create a torque which is gonna rotate the satellite about its center of gravity, which is this uh, symbol right here. So what we're gonna do in this uh, problem uh, is we're going to use the input will be the satellite's thrust from the thruster here, and the output variable or the effect will be the angular position theta of the satellite. So notice in this diagram here, uh, we show the, the thrust pushing the satellite this way, causing it to rotate um, in a uh, clockwise direction like this in our diagram. And so we're going to use theta here um, as our um, angular position in radians. And um, this uh, line here could represent an inertial reference frame uh, or inertial uh, direction. Okay, so um, let's start again with Newton's second law. Now, of course, here we're gonna use the rotational form of Newton's second law. So instead of net force equals MA, uh, we have net torque is equal to I alpha. And here, I is the rotational inertia of the satellite and alpha is the angular acceleration of the satellite. So um, alpha, remember, is related to, um, this is uh, from rotational uh, physics, alpha is the time derivative of omega, which is the angular velocity, and it's also the second time derivative, or theta dot dot, of the angular position theta. So since we're using uh, angular position theta as our output variable, uh, we want to change this alpha here to theta double dot. And so that's what we've done here on this um, right side of the equation here. Um, on the left, our net torque, all right, we have a thrust here at um, right angles to this distance D. You can see it um, marked here. D is the distance from the center of gravity to where the thruster is positioned on the satellite. So that is our torque. Our torque is thrust times that distance d, and that is our, our net torque. So here's our, um, this is Newton's law, what it looks like now. Thrust times d is equal to i times theta double dot. We can then take the Laplace transform, that's the next step of our differential equation here. So we have T of s, that's the, the transform of the thrust, times d equals i, and then the theta double dot is a second derivative. So again, using the differentiation property of the Laplace transform, we pick up 
an S squared term in front of theta of S. So again, uh, with our input being um, the thrust and our output being theta, we can define our transfer function. H of S is the output theta divided by the input T. And from this equation here, just doing some simple division uh, to get theta over T, we see we have uh, D over, um, over I S squared, and the D and the I can be combined into a single constant there. So we end up with a uh, transfer function that is a constant over S squared. Our next example is something we've actually done before, so I'm not gonna go through it in great detail. Uh, in chapter nine, we learned how to find the transfer function for an LRC circuit. Um, but I just wanted to include it here in this uh, chapter to again show um, the uh, variety of systems that we can um, apply these methods to. So uh, in chapter nine, we took uh, an LRC low pass filter like this with a resistor, inductor, and a capacitor. And the method was uh, we replaced these components with their impedances, their Laplace transform impedances. So the resistor just becomes R, the inductor L becomes S times L, and the capacitor becomes one over S times C. And then we can use from here, uh, we can use the voltage divider rule to find the transfer function, which is the output divided by the input. So again, we, we did this uh, in chapter nine, so I won't go through the details here, but here, here is the final form of the transfer function, which is uh, found you know, pretty directly uh, right from the schematic here by making those replacements. So if you want to see the details on this, um, look back in chapter nine. Here's our last example that we're going to look at in this video lecture. Uh, this example is the hydraulic piston actuator. So hydraulic pistons are very useful actuators. For example, airplane flaps and rudders are controlled by hydraulic pistons. So here we're going to look at a very simple model of a hydraulic piston with fluid pressure as the input variable and piston position as the output. So the way this um, device works is we have a, a pump somewhere outside of the uh, diagram here, which increases the fluid pressure here, and that pushes on this um, piston here, which then slides inside the cylinder, and this actuator arm, this would be attached to, say, the flap of an airplane. Um, this is going to move back and forth depending on the pressure of the liquid inside here. So um, using uh, just some basics from uh, fluids, fluid statics and dynamics, uh, remember that pressure is force per unit area. So the force on this uh, piston here is equal to the fluid pressure times the area of this uh, piston here. So the force here is labeled as pressure times area pushing uh, to the right. So Newton's second law, uh, F net is equal to MA. And so again, the net force, we're just going to assume this is the only force um, uh, on this actuator. So that's our pressure times area. And then we have the mass. And again, uh, we're gonna use the uh, piston's position as the output. So it's X position as it displaces back and forth. So we're gonna uh, convert acceleration into second derivative of position, X double dot here. So from this, um, differential equation, we can now do the Laplace transform. Uh, we have the Laplace transform of pressure, P of S, times the piston area A equals mass, and then we have X double dot, so we've seen this several times in this video, that picks up uh, the factor of S squared because of the second derivative, times X of S, and then the transfer function, H of S, is defined as the output, X, which is the position, divided by the input, which is the pressure. And so uh, from this equation here, we can divide, um, we can divide uh, both sides and get X over P. Uh, and we end up with on top, we have area over mass. And on the bottom, we have S squared. So there is our transfer function for the hydraulic piston actuator.